So, FinCEN has actually issued a proposal just this October trying to address what they think is a serious issue that comes from mixers. However, the government has always misapprehends how the underlying technology works, and they resulted with a proposal that would encompass day-to-day -day transactions on the blockchain, including, for example, single-use wallets, compartmentalization that was talked on the stage before, any type of pooling of funds. And I think one of the solutions that the industry is proposing and the government is, of course, completely oblivious to is privacy pools. Can you guys talk a little bit about how privacy pools would kind of ease the tension between the ethos of blockchain and privacy and anonymity and regulatory concerns that have to do with bad actors using blockchain and its ethos to perpetrate financial crimes? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's a history of governments being confused about new encryption technology dating back to when they tried to ban HTTPS and then later mandated HTTPS to be used on all government websites. And I don't think this is going to be much different than that because they know that they can't secure all of our data and so there's dangers to having these giant data honeypots and uh, it doesn't make sense that on a blockchain I would be forced to, you know, like nobody puts their Venmo on public, right? We all like make fun of people who do that. So uh, there's no reason why I should have to do that on a blockchain. Uh, and so I think that if we can accomplish the goals of the regulators, which is that they don't want, you know, legitimate uh, users who are deposit depositing their funds to be associated with uh, illicit funds, then there might be a way to get the best of both worlds where you get privacy for the legitimate users where, uh, without um, but helping isolate the illicit funds. Yeah, and privacy is a human right. Um, your bank account isn't public by default. Um, you should have the right to share what data you'd like to share with the world. Um, that should be optional. Um, so. Yeah, and I think one of the arguments that are now being heard in DC and are so infuriating is that suddenly, because you're a blockchain user, you don't have any of your constitutional rights anymore. You live in the US and suddenly you're supposed to be disclosing every part of your transactions and every part of your day-to-day -day life. Despite that, even within the community, when the privacy pool paper came out, you guys did face a little bit of criticism from supporters of more anarchist views, I would say. Why do you think that is, and how do you address that? I think part of the reason is because they don't want to update their systems to incorporate new uh, ways of allowing users to have more sovereignty over their own privacy, uh, like privacy pools lets you do. So, uh, for example, you know, I don't want to associate with the funds from a hacker who hacked my friend's DeFi protocol. But if I don't have the option of dissociating publicly, then I'm sort of forced into that. And so uh, I think that there's some natural tension there because uh, maybe they think, oh, well, it's better for the world if everybody's forced into associating with everybody. Uh, and I don't really agree. I think given the preference, I would choose to not associate with the terrorists or you know, IRGC or people who hack my friends or what have you. Uh, and that just requires building a slightly better compliance system into these privacy tools. And at the same time, privacy pools are designed in a way that essentially you opposed any type of disclosure to centralized authority, correct? Still, you would have safeguards that wouldn't allow a government now or 100 years from now or nine months from now to be able to exploit that data. Yeah, so the way the privacy pools smart contract and protocol is designed is that uh, it doesn't have any sort of centralized access uh, or uh, admin keys or, you know, prep, like preferences for specific governments. Uh, so it doesn't collect any of this information. You basically decide as a user 
uh, who are the other deposits that I'm willing to associate with and not. Uh, if the services that provide those lists collect data, that's, you know, you're choosing to use those services. It's not necessarily one group that's getting all of the data. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of these systems is the way that they promote scalability of DeFi, and they also promote uh, practical aspects of how this could be used and how they could promote broader use. Zach, you want to tell us a little bit about that? <clears throat> yeah, so I think in order to scale DeFi and kind of uh, bring it to a broader market that's outside of just like retail and like DGENs and everybody here, we need to provide uh, like a better atmosphere for institutions, uh, like hedge funds, banks, any organization that needs to follow particular guidelines uh, to participate in a healthy way. Um, so what Privacy Pools does is it essentially allows um, uh, those who are participating in these liquidity pools to uh, know for certain that they're not commingling assets, um, who they're participating with, and uh, I think that's going to be a pretty big thing for this like next wave in the market. And do you see that there is also, or there could be an intersection between blockchain and TradFi that for example, a traditional bank could use privacy pools. Yes, it would be a very different type of privacy pool, which would be limited to their customers, but it could still be used by them and protect privacy even more. Yeah, absolutely. I think that all of traditional finance is going to be uh, on Ethereum within the next five to 10 years. And I think we're building towards that. I look at the ETF now. So what's it going to look like in the next five years? I think that we need systems like this in place in order to create that atmosphere that enables that uh, broader participation. Yeah, and like there's practical examples where it can be useful today. So when I withdraw from Kraken, for example, it says, you know, Kraken 3 to my address, right? Uh, you can imagine a privacy pool amongst exchanges that would obfuscate which specific exchange I have a relationship with so that, you know, somebody trying to get my data doesn't know who which exchange to call up and bribe in order to get the information. Uh, banks, uh, especially banks in Switzerland, who have an enlightened view about privacy, unlike the American surveillance state bankers, want to uh, promote the, you know, they also want to participate in DeFi without revealing their competitive edge. So that's another use case for them where they just want that uh, in order to scale up DeFi. Or even more practically, like payroll. This is really the best one. Yeah, or, or sending, my <laughs> <Often> overlooked. <laughs> sending my mistress some money. <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that. We Not that I know. I don't that. know anything about that either. Love my wife. Privacy. Privacy is a right. You know, it's, we're not going to judge on how someone uses it. And part of the issue with what FinCEN is doing and, what, and the way government is still viewing AML and KYC procedures is that in the future, these are not going to work the way they work today. And we're looking into alternatives in how you can implement these procedures. And do you see privacy pools and similar systems or something like Oxbow is doing in being able to facilitate something that works more efficiently and taking into account these concerns? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Oxbow is our compliance solution for privacy pools, monitoring all of the deposits and providing you know, a judgment on whether or not we think it's acceptable for them to join our association set, which would then be all of the users who withdraw and are part of that association set would be associating with. And so uh, we're doing pretty rigorous wallet analysis that goes beyond KYC. And KYC is basically going to be broken in the next year. It's already getting broken. Like people are generating AI you know, wallet IDs and stuff, and it's not going to work as well. And even if you get past the KYC of the system, you still want to trace it back and be like, oh, actually, this does come from this DeFi hack. I don't care who you are. Uh, I care that your money isn't illicit. And mm -hmm. so I think it's going to be even more important in the future. Yeah, so I, I think this is going to kind of uh, hopefully take the place of KYC to some extent. Um, you don't really need to prove who you are. I don't need to know your name necessarily. I just need to know that you're not a uh, sanctioned individual, you're not a North Korean, you're not some baddie out there that's trying to do something weird. Yeah, exclusion. 
what do you see as the weaknesses of privacy pools? Like we have inclusion delays, you do need the intermediaries. What do you see as one of the creators as the gaps that you want to see filled in the future? Sure. Like our original privacy pools demo was a point and click. And so you'd see all of the other deposits and you have to be like, you know, I'm not this guy, not this guy, not this guy. And so that's not really a scalable solution uh, for pri something like privacy pools to work at scale. It does require this uh, data analytics role, which can do the monitoring to, to make the lists, right? Um, that's one maybe, you know, weakness of the system. In the future, it would be cool if everybody had access to their own personal, you know, uh, <laughs> monitoring systems that, that scaled, but uh, I don't see that happening just yet. Uh, she mentioned the, the time delays. So one of the ways that, you know, privacy pool would be used is for when, you know, when somebody deposits, they're not immediately added to the association set. There's a delay. We're thinking three days a week, you know, ho hopefully less, but something like that to give us time to do the retroactive tracing of the funds and in order to, you know, make sure that the system doesn't allow illicit funds in. And one of the issues that I think the paper touches upon, and I think everyone is interested in, is how do you defend against malicious ASP? And that's kind of built into the ethos of the system. You want to explain that a little bit? Um, like people improperly being yeah. at, like rejected from the yeah. yeah, I mean, ideally you don't want like the CIA guy's girlfriend to be like excluded because he hates her or something. Uh, and so you would want to have a system that has some internal checks and balances. Unfortunately, this isn't something that you can really make public because there's a lot of you know, private information involved in the judgments, but uh, having multiple stakeholders who have you know, transparency and, and uh, into the you know, decisions that are made around the judgments and for what reasons people are rejected and accepted uh, would be helpful to mitigating any personal you know, in yeah, attacks. And <laughs> you might be able to implement some sort of social consensus as well. If you're in enough association sets, you can essentially attest to uh, the, your peers within that association set. And the more association sets you're in, that kind of adds some degree of hardness to the identity and associating that identity with like one of the good guys or not being one of the bad guys. <laughs> Do you guys want to talk a little bit more about Oxbow, what you're working on now, how will this develop, and what you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, sure. Uh, Oxbow, so we're, right now we're uh, one of the, we're the first association set provider, so that's essentially vetting all of those lists and making sure that uh, uh, there aren't any addresses present within that association set that are uh, uh, sanctioned entities or, um, hackers, just general bad guys, people that are exploiting things within the system that we're aware of. Um, so that might extend to additional tooling that allows other users to create their own association sets. Uh, for now, we're just an information provider. So, um, but we plan on scaling and doing a lot more stuff within the privacy stack. Yeah. Okay. And I think, I mean, you mentioned that you have been trying to work with the regulators, educate the government on how this will work. I will emphasize that this is critical. Like, we were in DC yesterday meeting with different Senate staff, and like, the ignorance is just enraging. One of the questions that the Warren staff asked was, well, there's no way to combat mixers, so we need the report of every single transaction, which you don't have with banks, by the way, as you just said. So I think it's really important. Do, have you seen any progress when you're talking to them? Do you see that there is actually like a way to work with them? Yeah, I think something people should realize is that something like privacy pools on one single axis is actually the best thing on the planet. Uh, you can't go into a bank today and withdraw from the bank and publicly prove that you're not the illicit deposits that went into the bank. You can't do that with Coinbase. You can't do that with any other system ever except something like privacy pools. Uh, obviously, it doesn't do everything else a bank does, but on that one axis, it's better. And so I think coming from the position of uh, teaching them about the new compliance opportunities is helpful because they think, you know, every mixer is the same or, you know, and I hate using that word, but uh, <laughs> you have to educate them that it's not even really a mixer, right? Yeah, I don't think it's even a mixer, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and so um, th they've been receptive. Uh, it's not super evenly distributed who's receptive, right? There's uh, Swiss central bankers who I believe are uniquely enlightened 
because uh, one of them proposed that uh, privacy from the central bank itself for the users, it should be a feature that benefits the users. That's not something you'll hear very often in America, but I think that that helps legitimize uh, privacy as a useful thing, right? They're concerned about honeypots. They don't want to have to deal with all the data. They get hacked. They reveal all this stuff. That's a security threat. So um, for them, it's much better if, if they have ways of preserving people's privacy. And how do you do that? Well, you use the same zero-knowledge proof systems that we've been building and iterating on. And so they were, you know, when I went to the, uh, the Basel uh, University with Fabian and presented the stuff, uh, they were very interested. He's been continuing to educate them. I went to a con regulatory conference in Philadelphia where I presented the Privacy Pools paper to, I don't know, CFTC, FinCEN, SEC, DOJ people. And that was also helpful. Obviously, they have concerns, but we're still being able to make some progress on educating them about the opportunities for compliance. And it's important because we didn't even really know this stuff was possible, right? So like, it was only after the tornado cash sanctions that we started, you know, tried to figure out this problem of how do we, you know, publicly dissociate from these illicit funds and realize that there is this compliance opportunity. And the reason that we went, uh, moved so fast to try and write this paper with Fabian about it uh, was because he was providing recommendations to the regulators about what the law should be around privacy. And so we thought it was very important that they all understand what the total you know, playing field of compliance opportunities are before they make all of the laws. And I think it's really, really important, I can't emphasize that enough, to change the regulator's perspective of the industry. And most of the times we talk to them and we're trying to say, we want to be regulated, we want to be compliant, you guys are not even trying to work with us. And perspectives like this one and proposals like this one shows that the industry wants to exclude bad actors and is actually actively trying to find solutions rather than say, oh, everyone in the industry is the same, we never want to comply with the laws, we don't care if we work with North Korea, which is fundamentally untrue and it's being used by politicians and certain regulators in order to pay in the industry a certain way to promote their own financial interests and their own political interests. So I think what you're doing, both of you, is incredibly important. If you have any final thoughts on privacy pools or anything else you'd like. Uh, one way I'm kind of thinking about it is like SSL for money markets. And that's kind of like a pretty simple uh, explanation. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. SSL, which was banned by the government and then mandated yeah. to be used. And uh, that's what enables <laughs> online banking. Yeah. So, what's the next generation going to look like? I think it's going to look a lot like this. Yeah. Check out uh, privacypools.com and uh, oxbow.io, spelled with a zero X. Okay, let's see what will be next year, this time yeah. of the year. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it here next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank hopefully you. Hopefully, you'll both. all join us yeah. again. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>